Today, we're diving into the story of Dreadweight, a cute-looking psychological horror game with a connection to Eastern European folklore, which we'll discuss in this video. Dear Dream Studios, the developers behind this game are no strangers to the psychological horror scene. Dreadweight serves as a standalone sequel to their previous title, Cooking Companions, a game about friends that may or may not end up eating one another. But that's a story for another time. Now, in Dreadweight, you meet a colorful cast of characters and your choices impact the game's ending, of which there are many. In this explanation, I'll start by recapping the story from the perspective of my playthrough, touching on some of the endings. Afterwards, we'll do a deep dive into each of the endings. Then we'll conclude with an explanation of what it all means. Got that? Good. Let's go! We start off with this poor soul who's just stumbled into a storm-battered town called Zakopane. They're soaking wet and probably wondering why they didn't just stay home and binge watch Netflix. But no, they had to go on an adventure. We meet Jarek, the friendly neighbor. He's all, hey stranger, come on in, dry off, have some tea and crusty bread. Sounds cozy. But it turns out Jarek's been reading some old judge's diary and he's convinced our protagonist is actually an ancient witch. Without even confirming such harsh accusations, Jarek draws his weapon and BAM! Are we dead? Just when you think things can't get weirder, we adopt the perspective of Baba Yaga, aka the Witch of the East, and we wake up somewhere completely different. We're greeted by a talking potato. Yup, you heard that right. A talking potato. This spud's got an attitude and a mission. It wants to go to some cabin for a nice meal. I don't know about you, but when food starts talking about meals, I get a little nervous. Afterwards, a raspberry joins the party. She's warning the witch about some mansion, rituals, and three mysterious figures. It seems like it's a nice raspberry warning of impending doom. But nope! He threatens us and assures us if one of the three doesn't kill us, it'll hunt us down and do it himself. Lovely. Now we no longer embody the witch and we return to the main character of the game. We collapse right outside of the mansion, and next thing you know, we're holding hands with a guy named Kurt, meeting a whole cast of characters, including Dimitri, Gisela, and Renata. They lead us into the mansion. The group welcomes us into the mansion, offering us hairy water and a lifting competition with Miss Beefcake. Yeah, that'll go well. The phone rings in the mansion, and apparently it's our job to stop the ringing in someone else's home. After searching for the phone, we pick it up and receive a busy tone. And just when you think things can't get any stranger, a talking duck named Maximilian shows up. This feisty ducky claims to be the smartest creature in the mansion. Because of course, in a world with talking potatoes and murderous raspberries, why wouldn't there be a genius duck? Max is cryptic and tells us that if we help him with his goals, then he'll help us escape. He's handing out stinky ropes that could ward off witches. Now we can decide who we want to talk further with out of the four humans. We'll go with Gisela because she is a brick and we should stay on her good side. Apparently, if they had a morgue, it'd be full because of her combat skills. Our protagonist is now getting a grand tour from Gisela. She's showing off the cellar, which is basically a fancy wine storage that's not making enough money to fix up the crumbling mansion. And it seems this place isn't just falling apart. It's got a history of lab accidents that have left it in ruins. And Kurt, the owner, is too busy with his research to care about little things like, you know, Walls falling down. Now, remember that stinky rope our hero got from Max the Duck? Well, Gisela's not impressed. She's all, I don't need no magic rope to deal with witches. Tough cookie, that one. Then suddenly, we are the witch again. The talking foods are back, and they've gone full-on political. Potato's now the leader of the Champettes, and he's not messing around. He's talking about correcting pain and making deals that involve... Um, murder. As the witch and player, we have the option to agree to do his dirty work so we don't have to spend eternity with the foods in the graveyard. And now we are the main protagonist again. There's a cursed witch from the Tatra Mountains running around, breaking through deadbolts like they're made of paper. And our hero's got a new toy, a bolt cutter. We go upstairs to look for more weapons to prepare ourselves for the confrontation with the witch. Before we can find any, we see a radio that we must take with us and receive another mysterious call with weird mutters. And of course, we meet another talking creature, a rabbit named Clover, who tells us about Kurt's lost notes and books. As our protagonist chats with Clover, we learn that, apparently, the witch on the loose can rip out the spirit from a swimming fish. So we are totally doomed and might as well accept our fate, I guess. Clover's trying to convince our hero to do some, let's call it preemptive self-defense against Kurt and Gisela. Clover thinks that if we take out Kurt, then maybe the witch will spare the rest of us since that's her ultimate target. 
The only other option is to get rid of Gisela, his bodyguard, so the witch can have easy access to Kurt. But our protagonist's not having it. They're more of a, let's not murder anyone today kind of person. Clover gives us a tarnished pendant. Wonder how this will help with the deadly witch. Meanwhile, Gisela's gone full Bob the Builder, nailing all the windows shut. She sends our hero on a nail-fetching mission to the cellar. We bring Gisela the nails, and in return, she gives us a wrench. But there seems to be no hope. The mansion's falling apart even more. The wiring's gone haywire, fuses are blowing left and right, and there's a witch playing hide-and-seek somewhere in the house. We have the choice to go upstairs with Renata or downstairs with Dimitri to find weapons for protection. Personally, I say we go upstairs. That dungeon is creepy. But the weapon upstairs is missing? Well, that's unfortunate. Our protagonist goes back down to the foyer and Dimitri is missing. Gisela thinks he's dead. So since everything here is our job to fix, we go check out the fuse box downstairs since the lights are going haywire. Kurt says we have to go by ourselves because he can't afford to lose Gisela or Renata. Wow, I guess we're chopped liver. We put a lever and a new fuse on the fuse box. Good as new. Then suddenly, jump scare. Wait, was that Dimitri? Things take a turn for the worse when we dream about Kurt eating mushroom stew. And not the fun kind of mushrooms. We're talking deadly poisonous ones. He's being fed a toxic brew by the witch. And just like that, we're the witch again and back with a talking veggie, cabbage. But plot twist. Apparently, the witch left the Champettes years ago and can't even remember it. Hmm, so now she has amnesia. This memory makes the witch cry. Oh, she does have a heart. Oh, and blood on her hands. Next thing we know, our protagonist wakes up in bed with Kurt. Yeah, you heard that right. Apparently, we had a little feigning spell after a ghostly encounter, and Kurt decided the best remedy was a cozy cuddle. He says he just wanted a quick nap. We are in a freaking mansion, and you had to do it right up in my grill. Kurt's got some sage advice for our hero. If the witch asks us a riddle, just change the subject. Hmm, what? We are given the choice again who we want to talk to. So let's go talk to our homegirl. Gisela's gone from tough bodyguard to paranoid conspiracy theorist, though. She's asking about landmines and grenades. Our protagonist is trying to keep it cool, but let's face it, when your bodyguard starts talking about explosives, it's time to reconsider your life choices. As always, Gisela gives us a gift. This time it's a candle. The witch finally makes her grand entrance, and surprise, she's not the cackling old hag everyone expected. In fact, she's downright sweet as a pound cake. Her words, not mine. She's got a simple request. Get Gisela to leave the mansion. Easy peasy, right? Oh, and she casually hands over a landmine. You know, just your average housewarming gift. The witch assures us it will take Gisela's legs right off. As the player, we have the option to destroy it. But if you do indulge the witch and place the landmine somewhere and a character steps on it, the entire mansion crumbles down. This kills everyone except Kurt, who escapes from the rubble. Either way, the witch disappears, leaving our protagonist alone with our thoughts. So now our protagonist decides to spill the beans to Gisela about meeting the witch. But instead of freaking out, Gisela's more concerned about getting tortured back on the mainland. I guess she'd rather take her chances of being skinned by the witch than get locked up. Then we've got Renata spilling some beans as well. Apparently, Kurt's been playing secret agent, bugging phones and blackmailing people. And he's even got bear traps and big rugs to cover up holes in the floor to make booby traps. Then our hero decides to tell Renata about their furry and feathered friends, Max the duck and Clover the rabbit. And her reaction? Talking animals? In this economy? She's not buying it. Then we get a crash course in conspiracy theories and government surveillance. Renata's going full Edward Snowden, talking about spying, civil rights icons, and unfair trials. Oh, and she throws the U.S. under the bus. Then Renata leads our hero to a secret kitchen through a crack in the wall. Because every haunted mansion needs a secret, moldy kitchen. And what's on the menu? A creepy oven that needs fixing and a new quest to feed it. If you place the landmine in the oven, you explode and die, ending the game. Oh yeah, and we get another jump scare. To avoid the jump scare, you can place the candle there and light it with the gas tank, which completes the puzzle. We are knocked out by Renata's ghost and find ourselves dreaming about Kurt again. Is this turning into a twisted rom-com? Our dream, Kurt, clues us in on his backstory. He technically died and was reborn. He was very poor and ill, which led to his death. But when he was reborn, he was cured. After our protagonist wakes up from yet another cozy nap, but now with Gisela, we learn we've been having Kurt's memories in our dreams. 
Gisela's all, oh, don't worry, that's just a side effect of bringing you here. Because apparently memory bleeding is just a normal thing in this mansion. Meanwhile, Renata's gone MIA, and Gisela's found blood but no body. Gisela's new strategy? No more solo trips downstairs. It's the buddy system for everyone. Oh, and when we ask why Gisela's cuddling with us, she says the same thing. Just taking a nap. We are in a mansion, for goodness sake, people. Get out of my bed. While looking for Kurt, we get squawked at by none other than Max, the talking duck. And he's got questions. He's fishing for info about Clover the rabbit, and he's handing out dead men's ties. Nothing says, I'm trustworthy, like gifting someone a deceased person's clothing, right? Max also suggests killing the witch, and the hauntings might stop, and reminds us about the mysterious box which contains something that could save everyone. Kurt's back on the scene too, getting all watery-eyed over Dimitri's tie and confessing to some shady horse-stealing business, and our protagonist starting to remember things they shouldn't know. Then suddenly, the lights start failing. Our protagonist decides to brave the dark cellar, because apparently we forgot about the buddy system and the fact we shouldn't be in dark places for too long. We stumble upon a room that smells like wet dog mixed with black mold. There is also an ancient laboratory and a ceremonial room. In the midst of this spooky exploration, we find a mysterious letter about food aid and Soviet governments. Suddenly, while we are told by Kurt to not talk to ghosts, our hero gets pulled down into a pit by Dimitri's ghost. You land on a ledge, avoiding becoming a human pancake by mere inches. We are woken up by Clover, the rabbit. He's talking about cracking open rib cages and sewing Max the duck inside of us if we don't take care of Kurt quicker. At least he gives us directions to get off this ledge. Next, we embody the witch again. Enter Onion, who congratulates us for taking care of Dimitri and Renata. Oh, and we learn about the annual Champette comedy competition. I guess there is no better time than the present for a good old fashioned joke contest between the talking foods. As the player, we decide who wins. I decided the winner is bread, of course, with a yeast infection joke. Finally, we make it out and go to the bedroom to search for any sign of Kurt or Gisela. Our protagonist searches under beds and in closets. We see our breath under the bed, which is either a sign of ghostly activity or really poor insulation. Our protagonist continues playing detective, snooping around under beds and finding all sorts of goodies. We discover a med kit, always handy in a haunted house, some mysterious white hair and a juicy personal note about Renata's shady past. Then we run into Gisela, who's apparently been channeling her inner ninja, sneaking around the mansion through secret passages. She's on a mission to find a magical tome that can weaken a witch's bones. Gisela runs downstairs to find out what the banging sound is in the cellar and to avoid answering our question. She accidentally slipped and revealed to us that she had seen Dimitri come back from the dead. We are curious about the sound and follow Gisela, but suddenly, bam, our hero is attacked by a ghost on the way down the stairs and ends up face to face with the witch herself. She's got a fight to pick and is handing out bear traps. She is hoping we will place the bear trap for Gisela to step on, but we aren't that crazy. This could definitely work against us. Max the duck makes another appearance. He wants us to continue to try and kill the witch as soon as possible. He's still obsessed with that mysterious box and dropping hints about Kurt's whereabouts and handing out rusty keys. We are now playing from the witch's perspective again. She grips the knife and is ready to make a move. Out of nowhere, Gisela pounces on the witch. This encounter ends in a flash and the witch is with her food friends again. Basically, Raspberry and Potato have two different views on what needs to happen next. Potato wants the witch to continue on the Kurt mission while Raspberry is giving her an out by going to the cabin together. The player can choose who to follow. I am going to continue on the Kurt mission because we're in too deep now. We are presented with a flashback. It's when Kurt was first interacting with Renata. She signs a waiver to have an experiment done on her to erase her memory of her time in prison. Despite the unknown side effects of the procedure, Renata is desperate to rid her memory of the trauma. Dimitri, the good little doctor he is, is hesitant to do the procedure. He's concerned about the terrible things that could happen, like Renata becoming paralyzed or non-human. And what does Kurt have to say about this? He has solutions a little too readily available. He assures Dimitri that he could sacrifice her to the witch or he'll crush her skull himself if the experiment goes wrong. What a great planner he is. Gisela bursts onto the scene with a fresh eye injury, courtesy of our friendly neighborhood witch. Kurt, being the resilient guy he is, gets stabbed but comes back like it's just another day in the mansion. During all of this chaos, Gisela's memories come back. She underwent an experiment like Renata. 
except her trauma isn't from jail, but from her own terror. She recalls all the massacres she caused. At least she seems a bit remorseful. The witch pops up again, claiming she was just acting in self-defense. Ah, uh, yes, self-defense by gouging out someone's eye. I mean, yeah, Gisela attacked her out of nowhere, but the witch has killed two of the people in the mansion recently. So, yeah. Meanwhile, Gisela decides she's had enough of this haunted house party and plans to swim to Denmark. Can't blame her, really. Freezing waters seem preferable to staying in this madhouse. This timing is unfortunate because if she would have just left from the beginning, then maybe Renata and Dimitri wouldn't have died. We then talk with Dimitri and are given choices of either killing Kurt, the witch, or Gisela. Our protagonist is left juggling conversations with ghosts, a trigger-happy Kurt, and a witch who's offering to finish the job with Kurt. Oh, and we get one final jump scare. And just then, Kurt pulls out a gun and starts questioning our hero about a mysterious radio. Because what the situation really needed was more firepower. Then, the witch shows up and puts a knife to our hero's throat. Great. We are now embodying the witch again. We jump to a scene with Potato. They're digging up the last vessel and chatting about failed attempts and preserving bodies. We, as the witch, confront Kurt, who knows we found the last vessel. He expresses his desire to be remembered. Ironic for him doing experiments on others to forget so much. The witch is over it and assures him no one will remember him. Kurt idolizes her in a totally twisted way. He wants to work with her, not against her. The player, as the witch, can destroy the last vessel, a black egg, which is the key to Kurt's immortality. I'll explain this a bit more later. For my choice, the witch is done with Kurt's antics and destroys the egg, which disintegrates his body. After all the mayhem, we finally get to see who we are as the protagonist throughout the game. We are an investigator. We question Kurt before he leaves the dock from the island that the game was set on. We also know about his little cult he has going on at the mansion and want answers. Kurt doesn't like our questioning ways, so he summons Gisela to knock us out cold, and they take us to the mansion for experimentation. We then get a glimpse into Kurt's twisted plans about sacrificing us to the witch. This involves figuring out a way to regenerate our limbs so the witch can devour us over and over. And of course, they are going to wipe our memories of who we are. Oh, and if you're wondering how they do this, well, it involves an ice pick, mercury, and deer bones, obviously. The experiments Kurt performed on himself has made his hair the secret ingredient. If consumed, the person will have immortality. He's trying to replicate the abilities the witch has and is quite jealous of how she controls others' existence so effortlessly. We also learn about Kurt's adventures in the witch's cabin, which apparently involves stockpiling people like canned goods. Finally, we get a cryptic ending with Potato talking about brewing stews with hair, yum, traveling to different countries, and gearing up for a new adventure. All right, and that brings us to the different endings of the game. Dreadweight has nine official endings, each determined by the player's choices throughout the game. Number one, Renata ending. This ending occurs if the player aligns with Renata throughout the game. The protagonist learns about Kurt's experiments and the dark secrets of the mansion. As they uncover the truth, they realize the horror of what's been happening. In the final confrontation, the witch Baba Yaga appears, but instead of harming the protagonist, she helps them pass on. The ending suggests that by understanding and exposing the truth, the protagonist finds peace and is able to move on to the afterlife, leaving behind the horrors of the mansion. Number two, Dimitri ending. If the player chooses to trust and help Dimitri's ghost, they unlock this ending. Throughout the game, the player learns about Dimitri's past as a doctor and his involvement in Kurt's experiments. In the final scenes, Dimitri expresses gratitude to the protagonist for opening his eyes to Kurt's true nature. He admits to ignoring Kurt's misdeeds for a long time. The protagonist and Dimitri decide to pass on together, seeking what lies beyond death. This ending emphasizes themes of redemption and the power of facing the truth, even after death. Number three, Max ending. To get this ending, the player must focus on helping Max the duck in opening the mysterious box he keeps mentioning. When opened, the box contains three items, matches, a key, and handcuffs. The player must choose to take the matches, which is what Max has been searching for. Max reveals his plan to burn down the mansion, destroying all of Kurt's research. He believes this will prevent Kurt's dangerous knowledge from being used to control populations. The player can choose to escape by swimming, 
with Max explaining that due to Kurt's experiments, they'll keep regenerating until they make it to shore. This ending presents a drastic solution to the horrors of the mansion, emphasizing destruction as a means of preventing further harm. Number four, Clover Ending. This ending is achieved by choosing the key from Max's box. The player learns that Clover was one of Kurt's original experiments. If the player chooses to leave Clover in the mansion with access to Kurt's research, she becomes obsessed with the knowledge contained in the tomes. The ending shows Clover achieving perfection of the mind, but at a terrible cost. She becomes unable to leave the mansion, consumed by her quest for knowledge. Eventually, her physical form gives out, and she dies alone, still reading. This ending explores the dangers of unchecked pursuit of knowledge and the isolation it can bring. Number five, a lone ending. This is considered the worst possible outcome. If the player consistently chooses to avoid forming relationships or alliances with any of the characters, they end up in this situation. The protagonist becomes a lost spirit, wandering the mansion aimlessly, unable to remember who they are or why they're there. Even the witch, Baba Yaga, forgets about them. This ending highlights the importance of connections and relationships, showing the bleak existence of complete isolation. Number six, lover's ending. This unexpected ending occurs if the player, as the witch Baba Yaga, chooses not to crush the black egg, the last vessel, during the final confrontation with Kurt. Instead of destroying it, the protagonist decides to keep it. In this scenario, Kurt becomes the witch's soulmate, and they form a dark alliance. Kurt entrusts Baba Yaga with hiding the vessel. This ending suggests a future where the witch and Kurt work together, potentially continuing their sinister experiments and expanding their influence. Number seven, witch ending. In this ending, the player tries to join the witch and expresses a desire to use her powers for questionable purposes, like detaining those who disagree with laws. But there is a twist. The witch turns on us. The witch drags us down and ties us up in front of hungry spirits. They turn out to be the protagonists of the prequel, Cooking Companions. That's a fun throwback. Number eight, Kurt ending. This ending is achieved by choosing the handcuffs after opening Max's box. The player character is revealed to be an investigator who was originally trying to arrest Kurt. We encounter Kurt, who is funnily enough trying to flirt with the protagonist. But jokes on him, we use the handcuffs to arrest him right on the spot. And in an ironic twist, his immortality becomes the subject of government experiments. This leads to a dystopian future where world leaders use Kurt's secrets to become immortal, ending elections and creating eternal dynasties. Kurt himself is forgotten, buried in a concrete coffin. This ending explores themes of absolute power, corrupting absolutely, and the unintended consequences of scientific discovery. Number nine, Gisela ending. To achieve this ending, the player must consistently support and ally with Gisela. After the main events of the game, we become a ghost. We then join Gisela on her quest to hunt down the Witch of the East, using knowledge gained from another immortal woman. This ending is a continuation of the fight against evil, with the protagonist finding purpose in the afterlife by supporting Gisela's mission to make Europe safer. While these are the main endings, there are other ways the game can end as well. Examples include the landmine endings I mentioned earlier, such as by placing the landmine in the oven or having one of the characters step on it. There are also ways for the game to end through the witch's actions. Remember when we embody the witch and we hang out with Raspberry and Potato? Well, they give the player a choice, either follow Potato on the mission to kill Kurt or follow Raspberry back to the cabin. If we choose to go back to the cabin, then the witch is lured to the basement and the game ends right there and then. Kudos to the developers for coming up with so many endings. All right, so now you might be thinking, what the heck did we just watch? And that's a good question. So, let's try to piece together the bizarre puzzle that is Dreadweight. At its core, Dreadweight is a tale about immortality, memory manipulation, and the dark lengths people will go to in pursuit of power and eternal life. The story revolves around Kurt, a man who has discovered the secret to immortality through forbidden alchemy and horrific experiments. Kurt's mansion serves as the central location, a place where he conducts his experiments and houses his victims. The protagonist, initially presented as a newcomer to the mansion, is actually an investigator sent to uncover Kurt's crimes. However, upon arrival, they become entangled in Kurt's web of manipulation and experimentation. Oh, and the protagonist is a woman, by the way. We learn that from Kurt, who calls us a woman and a miss. Now, we need to talk a bit about Kurt. Remember how I said at the beginning that this game is based on Eastern European folklore? There seems to be a consensus that Kurt is a modern interpretation of the Koshai figure from Slavic folklore. 
Koshe the Deathless is known for his inability to die because he hides his death, or soul, inside a complex nested series of objects. His death is hidden inside a needle, which is in an egg, which is in a duck, which is in a hare, which is in an iron chest buried under an oak tree on a distant island. This elaborate hiding system makes Koshe nearly impossible to kill, as one must find and destroy the innermost object to end his life. And if me rattling off this elaborate system of hiding his soul reminded you of all the characters and objects we encounter throughout the game, that's no accident. Just like Koshe the Deathless, Kurt has discovered a form of immortality and has hidden his death or essence in a complex nested series of objects. In the game, these are referred to as vessels, with the final one being the black egg that we have the option to destroy. This directly parallels the folklore where an egg is the key to ending the life of Koshe. The presence of Max the duck and Clover the rabbit in the game mirrors the animals involved in the tales. The chest that we open as the witch at the end of the game is reminiscent of that chest that contains Koshe's egg in the folklore. The witch digs up the egg from a hole by a tree, which is a direct reference to how Koshe's death is buried under an oak tree in the folklore. Max the Duck also urges the player to open up a box, which leads to various different endings that end Kurt's tale in one way or another. And finally, the game takes place on an isolated island, similar to how Koshe's death is often hidden on a faraway island. Just as heroes in Koshe tales must unravel a complex series of nested objects and animals to reach Koshe's death, the player in Dreadweight must navigate through a web of interconnected puzzles, character relationships, and hidden truths to understand and potentially end Kurt's immortality. But the game also gives the folklore tale a modern, scientific twist. The talking animals, Max the Duck, Clover the Rabbit, and the Champettes, are likely early experiments of Kurt's that gained sentience. They represent different aspects of Kurt's research and its consequences. Max and Clover, being more articulate, might be more successful experiments, while the Champettes could be failed attempts or byproducts of the process. Kurt's experiments then escalated from animals to humans, with devastating consequences. The game reveals four main human subjects, Renata, Gisela, Dimitri, and the protagonist. Renata, whose name means reborn in Latin, was a former prisoner whose memories Kurt erased, symbolizing her rebirth under his control. Gisela, the bodyguard, represents strength and loyalty, though her memories of past violence suggest a dark history manipulated by Kurt. Dimitri, the doctor who assisted Kurt before his death, embodies the corruption of medical ethics in pursuit of immortality. The protagonist, an investigator turned unwitting test subject, represents the outside world drawn into Kurt's web of experiments. Kurt's notes reveal his process, using his own hair as a source of immortality, manipulating memories, and even planning to regenerate limbs for repeated harvesting. This gruesome escalation shows how Kurt's obsession with cheating death led him to commit increasingly horrific acts against both animals and humans in his quest for eternal life. The key to Kurt's found immortality seems to be linked to the consumption of human essence. We learn that his hair carries that essence of immortality, for instance, which he gives to his captives to make them immortal. This explains the numerous references to hair in the game, such as the protagonist being offered water that happens to have a hair in it at the beginning. Now, you might be wondering why Kurt keeps certain individuals around to the point of making them immortal. Well, he tells Dimitri that it's not just for his own experiments but also as potential bargaining chips or offerings to Baba Yaga. He believes that by offering her these food sources, he can gain her favor or knowledge. This means he's not just experimenting on people, but preparing them as sacrifices to an immortal being. This brings me to the witch, Baba Yaga. In the story, Baba Yaga serves as both an inspiration and a rival for Kurt. Her immortality is what Kurt aspires to achieve, driving his increasingly unethical experiments. The game suggests that Kurt's fascination with Baba Yaga led him to discover the secrets of immortality, which he then twisted to fit his own purposes. Furthermore, the contrast between Baba Yaga and Kurt highlights the different approaches to immortality in the game. Baba Yaga represents a more traditional, mystical form of eternal life, while Kurt's methods are a disturbing mix of science and alchemy. But underneath it all, they are both vying for power and control. The underlying theme of the game appears to be the cost of immortality and the corruption of power. Kurt's experiments have not only physical consequences, the twisted creatures and talking animals, but also moral and psychological ones. The memory manipulation, the forced loyalty of his subjects, 
and the horrific acts committed in the name of science all point to the degradation of humanity in pursuit of eternal life. The game's title, Dread Weight, likely refers to the burden of knowledge and immortality that the characters carry. It's the weight of their actions, their memories, both real and manipulated, and the truths they've uncovered. But these are just my theories. And that brings us to the end of the trippy adventure that is Dread Weight. What do you think it all means? Do you agree with my theory? In any event, please remember to like the video, subscribe if you loved it, and let me know in the comments what other games you would like me to cover next. See you later, friends.